So uh, I want to invite you right out of the gate to be a little bit like Sherlock Holmes. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, and I just want you to, do, to deduce anything that you can from what I'm about to describe, okay? Any conclusions that you think you can draw based on what's going on. And I give you full permission to tell the person next to you as we go along, okay? Feel free to tell them what you think can be concluded from all this as we go along. Uh, about a month and a half, maybe two months ago, a friend of mine who happens to work at my favorite store, REI, uh, sends me an email and says, hey, here's when the discounts and sales and all this stuff is coming up. And she said, hey, on this date, there's going to be a garage sale. Now, at uh, REI, the garage sale is this deal where they take all the used gear that people have returned because they're not satisfied with it, and they put it out for like 40 to 60% off. And you can buy gently, like barely used gear for crazy prices. Uh, now, normally, I don't care at all about stuff or buying stuff until it's at REI. And, uh, and until it's 40 to 60% off. And so, uh, so immediately, I put that on my calendar. And a couple or three times since, for the last month and a half, two months, I've said no to things because of the garage sale. Okay? And so uh, it's Friday night. And I start talking to a couple of buddies, and we make plans to set up a tent outside of REI the night before and just sleep out so there's no chance we would have to be second in line. We could just be first in line. By Friday night, I was too tired for that. But providentially, after going to bed at my own house uh, the night on Friday night, I woke up at 2.45 in the morning on Saturday. Just happened to wake up in the middle of the night like, well, time to go. So I got in my car. And I drove to REI, and I took a bag that I had pre-packed just in case I would wake up early and, uh, and laid out this sleeping pad with a, a pillow and a blanket. Uh, I even brought my little jet boil thing to make some coffee in the morning so I wouldn't lose my place in line. And, and I went, and at, by 3.15, I was back asleep in front of REI. That way, at 7 o'clock, when they pass out the numbers, I was ready to be the first one in. All right? And so I go scope out all the gear, get my strategy together. And at 8 o'clock, I made a purchase, and I just want to share with you the purchase that I made. Here's part of it, right? A little Yeti cooler, and somebody's like, pastor's got to have a Yeti. Igloo's not good enough. What's the problem, bro? 60% off, everyone, okay? And this, um, the deal is this summer, I, I have this uh, sabbatical that we've been referencing, which is such a gift, and I just want to take this chance to say thank you uh, that you uh, participate and, and, and are part of a church that says, you know what? Pastors being full and rested periodically to get them so they're not depleted and run down and burnt out is a big deal. And it's crazy to me that the next three months, uh, I won't be around here doing anything productive. I'll be resting and getting ready for the next run. We do that for all of our employees. We, only, we have a couple weeks off of vacation a year, a lot like many of your jobs. But in the seventh year, uh, for pastors to get three months off. And so it's going to be amazing for my family. Lifelong memories is going to be awesome. And one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to travel around and do a road trip through national parks. So I'm going to need a cooler because when you have four kids, you need a lot of food, okay? Uh, and so I bought this cooler as part of it. Just a public service announcement. Don't put your kids in here and close the lid. <laughs> Just in case anybody didn't already know that. Uh, I just want you to know for safety reasons. Now, we'll do a lot of hiking and make a lot of memories together. And so I, I got a pair of shoes at, at like 60, 50% off or something like that that will go everywhere I want them to go, including the hike that I'll do at the end of my sabbatical, uh, where I'm going to, after the kids are back in school, Lord willing, I'm going to go do the John Muir Trail, which is a couple hundred miles through the Sierra Nevada. It'll take about three weeks. So I'm going to run those shoes into the ground. Uh, it may rain over those three weeks, so I bought my son Zeke a little rain jacket that was super cheap. Uh, I have a little collapsible dog bowl because I don't like to carry heavy stuff, and we have a dog. Uh, I bought these headlamps. Uh, there's three of them, because, not because I like things bright. That's not even enough for all my kids. Uh, but they're crazy cheap, so I bought some headlamps. Remember, you're drawing conclusions. What's important, all right? And then, uh, and then I bought an ax because I don't care about my kids' appendages. Um, <laughs> That's not true. Uh, I got to drive the tents, uh, the stakes on our tent because hotels are expensive when you have six people and tents are cheaper uh, and campfires are great. And so I bought all of that. So here's what I'd like you to do. Based on what I just shared with you, what would you say is important to me? You can just tell the person next to you. What, how many things could you say matter to me, are really important to me, important enough to get up at 2.45 in the morning, okay? Tell the person next to you. Save money. <laughs> Save money, I'm so cheap. Now, you can say lots of things, right? You maybe say outdoors, and that's totally true. You may say family, totally true. You, uh, you may say adventure, totally true. There's lots of things, but way more important than any conclusions about me is this. How did you know what was important to me? How did you know? 
What about that story allowed you to so quickly draw conclusions about what's important to me? It's the same thing that helps anyone, including you, know what's important to you. When things are important to us, we give ourselves to them. And we give all parts of ourselves to them. We give our time, right? We get up at 2.45 in the morning. Some of you are like, that dude's crazy. Some of you chase a white ball around a green field in the middle of the desert for hours, and you pay good money to do it. You tell me I'm crazy. I mean, I go different places at least instead of in a circle. You got your crazy. Don't, don't judge my crazy, okay? You give your time to it, right? You prioritize it on your calendar. Two months before I had booked this thing, clearly I said no to other things because this was important, right? We give our time. We give our energy. We give emotional energy to it. We get excited about it. If it doesn't go right, we dread it or we grieve it, right? We give it emotional energy. We give it mental energy. We do strategy and planning and coordinating and calendaring and all these different things, right? We give it all kinds of, we give it our physical energy, right? We, we lose sleep over it, or we make efforts or travel to different places. We give our voice and our awareness to things, right? I'm standing up here talking about this. I talk about venture all the time. You guys are like, shut up about the mountains, bro. And like, we give our voice to it. Now, millennials get this more than any, because they give their voice not just in person and not just in conversation with other people, but constantly on social media. They're communicating the things that are important to them all the time. And then once they find something that they run into, they amplify that by sharing it and multiplying it across other places. We can tell what's important to us by what we speak about, what we give voice to. You know, there's this other way that we show what's important to us. And you could probably draw the conclusion based on what we've done so far, right? It's not just our energy. It's not just our time. It's not just our calendar. It's not just our voice. What else is it? Money. Because <laughs> that's not free right? We give our money to things. We give our treasure to things, the things that, are, that matter to us. We offer those things to things that are really important to us. And when we don't offer it to those things, what does it say? It's not important. It doesn't matter. It's not worth it. The value isn't there. So no matter where you're at on this whole thing, this is how we all communicate value. We offer ourselves to things. You could make a list right now of what's really important to you. You don't even have to know anything about church or Jesus to agree with that. We give ourselves to the things that are important to us. And when you watch what people give themselves to, you can list the things that are important to them. Jesus said this in a particular way. So whether you believe in him or not, I think you might agree with him. He says this, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, heart for him was not just feeling, not just desire, it was, it was those things. But in that culture, heart also meant your intention, your will, your passion, which I love how passionate the younger generation is and how often that word is used. Sometimes we forget that passion is not just feeling, it's sacrifice and investment. That's what really reveals passion. And so as we step into those things, that's what Jesus says. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart, your investment, that's where things are important to you. Now, there's this subtle nuance to what he says. And this is where you have to, you have to go along with this, I think. But I think you'll find it to be true. Is that not only does what we invest in reveal where our heart is, what we give ourselves to can direct where our heart is that we can actually tell our heart where to go by where we place our treasure. When we invest time in something, we care more about it. When we invest energy in something, we care more about it. When we invest money in something, we start to care more about it, right? Remember the last time you purchased something and then one of your kids or some knucklehead next door messes it up? You know what I'm saying? You care about it because you just invested in it, right? When you invest in something, when you offer yourself or some of your resources or the good of your life to something, it actually directs or drives your heart to where it could go. And so I could ask you the question, just like you drew conclusions about what's important to me. We could just ask what's important to you, but I'd rather focus on a little bit different question. What would you like to be important to you? Because what Jesus says is if that's what you want to be important to you, put your treasure there and your heart for it will grow. That's where you'll find your heart, wherever your treasure is. Here at Canyon Ridge, we want our heart to be fully in the direction of joining Jesus and bringing life, that we wanna live well with Jesus, and we want other people to live well with Jesus. We want people, including us, to find more life than ever before. 
And so if that's true, if that's who we are as Jesus followers, then our treasure will actually lead our heart there. The more we place our treasure, our time, our energy, our emotion, our calendar, our voice, and absolutely our finances in that place, we will find our heart more and more and more with God. We will find our hearts more and more looking like Jesus over and over. So you actually have great control over where your heart ends up, Jesus says. He says, you want to direct your heart? Place your treasure strategically. That's what he says. And so we're going to talk about it just a little bit. What would happen in our lives if we placed our money in particular places? What would a vision for our lives, what would our lives start to look like, a vision for our lives start to look like if we actually placed our resources in things that mattered to God? And so I'm just gonna do this out of a couple different scriptures. I'll show you one here in a minute, but let's just start with what we've already said. When we give, if we take our finances in particular and give them away, when we give, here's what happens. We shape our heart. That's what Jesus said. He said, wherever you place your treasure, that's where you'll find your heart. So if you want your heart to change, move your treasure. That's what you do. Give it somewhere that is in the direction you want your heart to go. If you want your heart to be for Yeti, point it toward Yeti, right? Is that what I did? Is this a terrible idea right here? I don't think so. Jesus said this. Jesus said, don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but instead store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't break in or don't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. And then he says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So where's my treasure? It's not at REI. It's in the the little dude that goes in this thing, that that this wraps around. It's the one who I'm not going to let use that, right? (laughs) It's all the conversations along the walk. It's all the things that that as we as a family lean in together and have phenomenal conversations, make lifelong memories, as I instill value in my kids, as I show them how God has wired me at least and hopefully them to encounter him in the beautiful creation that he has spoken into existence, I'm storing up treasure in heaven, right? And so here's the deal. If you want your heart to go somewhere, place your treasure there. That's what we're trying to do. Right, and so shape our heart, and that's what he calls us to do. Now, the rest of this, I'm gonna give you four more things. If you're gonna give, what's gonna happen is you're gonna shape your heart. If you don't give, well, you will give to something, and it will shape your heart in some direction. You gotta choose which direction you wanna go. So you will shape your heart no matter where you give, but we can actually direct it. The rest of this comes out of a conversation between two churches, really, and this one guy in the middle, his name was Paul. Paul was a follower of Jesus, Uh, He met Jesus in a pretty dynamic way in Acts chapter 8 and 9. You should check it out in in the Bible. It's a phenomenal story. But Paul found himself between two churches, a church in Jerusalem, which was made up primarily of Jews. It's where the church started. And they had hit some really hard times. They had been persecuted after Jesus' death and resurrection. And they um, they were really, really struggling. They didn't have what they needed to get by. And then over here, there was this place called Corinth. Corinth which had mostly pagan background. They were Gentile people is is the way that we talk about them. They were not Jews. They didn't know the history of God's people, but they had found out who God was. They had found out that Jesus had paid everything for them to be in right relationship with God. And Paul was teaching them how to follow Jesus, showing them how to give their heart to God and the things that really matter. And so what Paul does is says, hey, you church in Corinth over here, I want you to take up an offering, a collection of finances And we're going to put it together with a bunch of other churches from your area, and we're going to send it to the believers in Jerusalem so that they'll have what they need. And we're going to look at two different letters where he talks just a little bit about that. Because the first thing he says about what happens when we do things like that, if we're really going to give a vision for our lives, not only will we shape our heart, but when we give, we can stop kidding ourselves. We can stop kidding ourselves. You know how we lie to ourselves all the time? I listened to Jim Gaffigan this week, and he's, there's all kinds of things that we are in total denial about, right? About the health of McDonald's, about the cleanliness of hotels, all kinds of stuff, right? And so uh, there's all kinds of things we live in denial about. One of the things we live in denial about pretty regularly is, uh, is, is we think we provide for us. And he says, hey, that's not actually true. As Christians, we know this. Those of you who don't follow Jesus, I'm so glad that you're here. You're listening in and checking this thing out. But as Christians, we have part of the peace that we have is we know we are not solely responsible for providing for ourselves. And Paul reminds them this a couple of different times. In in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse uh, 8, it says, and God will generously provide all you need. That when someone asks who the provider in your house is, you should not be looking to one or the other adults. 
That's not who the provider, it's not the breadwinner. The God is the one who provides everything, including the breath that you just took in. There's nothing we have that he doesn't give us. And he loves us and he's for us, and so we can trust him. We can stop lying to ourselves. We can stop accepting all the pressure of providing for ourselves, that it all rests on us somehow. That's crazy talk. We can come to our senses. We can stop kidding ourselves and realize it actually comes from God. He says it twice. He says it right after this in verse 10, for God is the one who provides. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. God's the one who provides. Another place in the scripture says, every good and perfect gift comes from our Father above. We trust that and we believe that. So when we lack, we know God's gonna carry us through. We know he can provide. In fact, the church in Jerusalem knew that. They were asking God and praying for God to provide. And guess how they, God provided? This church over here in Corinth. God provided because he's the one who provides. When we give, we remember that it's not all on us. That we have one who cares for us, who'll provide for us, who helps us, and that's our God. Now, number three uh, is this. When we give, not only will we shape our heart and we can stop kidding ourselves, but we will absolutely make a difference. The giving always makes a difference. When Paul wrote to these people in Corinth to inspire them to give, he says this in verse 11 through 14. And let's just keep count of how many differences are made when they give. You ready? Verse 11. Yes, you will be enriched, difference number one, in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God, difference number two. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers will be met in Jerusalem, difference number three, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God, difference number four. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. Maybe the same difference, maybe difference number five. For your generosity to them and all believers will prove that you are obedient, that us being obedient to God's call to give is a result to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection. Difference number six, I already lost count, of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. Giving always makes a difference. And who does it make a difference in, us or them? Both. Always. Can you imagine what it was like for the church in Jerusalem when they were desperately lacking and no idea how to move forward? And all of a sudden, believers that they had never met in another place who seemed to not even fit the category of godly people take their finances and send it to them in the name of Jesus. Over, it makes a difference. Giving always makes a difference. We always want our giving to make a difference. Now there's this other thing that's a summary. Here's the fourth one. We come together. When we give, we come together. Now I would have to read the whole book of 1 Corinthians to do that, and we don't have time for that, but you should do it. Because 1 Corinthians is all about unity in the church. This church in Corinth was having struggle with like uh, all kinds of dynamics and divisions among people. I know, I know you don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about racial tensions, gender discrimination. Uh, we don't know anything about any of that in our culture. But in their culture, they had all kinds of issues of division. One of those was the people who had followed God for a long time were kind of judgy of the people who hadn't followed God for very long. And the people who hadn't followed God for very long were pretty frustrated with the people who had been a part of God's story for a long time. And so check this out. When Paul, who's in the middle, wants to connect this division, what tool did he use to get to the hearts of people? How did he get, he, he wasn't just interested in these people not being hungry. He was interested in the hearts of two churches being united because nothing matters more than Christ. How did he get to them? Money. Money was the tool he used. He said, take up an offering and send it here. Because he knew where your treasure is, what? That's where your heart is. You want to connect hearts? Send money. Right? Parents, that's a message for all of you. Public service announcement. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, give credit where credit is due. When we give, especially when we give to God and God's people, we give credit where credit is due. I don't know if you caught this in, in chapter 9, verse 12. It said this, just so you know where the credit for this gift was. Let me just remind you, verse 12, two good things will result from the ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, which is really, really important. But equally important is this, and they will joyfully express their thanks to who? Because that's what we're about, isn't it? We want people to join Jesus. We want people to find life in God. 
The goal of every single follower of Jesus is to see every single person they know, including themselves, come fully alive in God. And so every single time we give, we give credit where credit is due. If something goes to someone in God's name, God gets the credit and they get connected to God, which is the point anyway. It's not about how much we do. It's not about humble brag. It's not about credit or our name engraved on anything. It's about God being famous. Because of what God did for us, we offer ourselves, including our finances, to others so that they can know God as well. And so tell me giving doesn't make any difference. Tell me giving doesn't shape your heart. Jesus says you can place your heart, just strategically place your finances. Tell me it doesn't bring us back to reality that the weight isn't fully on us that God will provide. He's a good, good father. He's fully capable of taking care of us without using every single cent and then some that comes into our world. We get free of that. And we make a difference because I don't know a single person who wants their life not to matter. It's one of my other favorite things about millennials. You demand that the things that you're a part of make some sort of difference in the world. I love it. Giving does that. And it causes us to come together. And the church should be the place that we come together. There should not be racial tension in the church. There should not be gender inequality in the church. There should not be socioeconomic divisions within the course of our church. Because Jesus matters more than all of it. And we come together under him. And above all, we give credit where credit is due. And for me, that's a captivating vision for giving. The fact that God said it is enough for me, but on top of all that, he helps us understand why it matters so much. And so let me, um, let me make a suggestion. I think we should all give here. Whoop, walls just went up. I felt them, I saw them. You know why? Because I think you're worth my heart. And I think I'm worth yours. And if you place your treasure here, I'll fight for you. And you'll fight for me. And you can look down the row and not wonder if that person is for you. Because their heart is more and more here. And more and more for the people that God has called to this place in this season for this time. So I give here. And I think you should too. And, and, and I need to know that it's not all on me because I got enough stress that I've taken on myself for no reason, and I don't always trust God when he says don't worry about anything, and I don't need that stress. And so I give consistently, and I give here, and I think you should too. But I think every single one of us should give in a place that really actually makes a difference, don't you? I think that if we're gonna use the money that God has given us, I actually think that we're bound to use that to make a difference in the world that points people toward God. And so the question is, is this the place that that happens? Well, I would ask you, has this place, has these people, have churches like this, the local church, made any difference in your life? I think every single one of us has a story of the difference the local church has made it. In fact, we would invite you to share the story because we want to tell it. On the back of your handout, there's a thing that says stories at canyonridge.org. And your story matters. I don't care how it compares to anybody else's story. If God's made a difference, tell the story. And then tell it on social media and tell your neighbor and tell the person next to you as you walk out of here in just a little bit. Tell the story. Because we want to give credit where credit is due. But let me just ask a bigger question. Does this church make any difference? Does it make any difference? Now, I get that sometimes people look from the outside. And it's a little hard to tell. It's like, do they really need that much landscape? You know what? Do they really need air conditioning? Yes. Do they... Do they need that many lights? I don't know. Maybe it's just about a light show. Maybe it's just about coffee. Maybe it's about all these other things. And I get it. Listen, I, I get that. But here's the, here's the thing that people don't see, right? People see a family of four walk onto our campus. And they're just walking in as a family of four. What people don't see, and they don't always hear about because we don't always do the best job. We don't tell our stories well enough. What they don't see is that six months before, the man in that group of four people was ready to end his life that moment. Because the night before, his wife said, I'm out of here. I can't handle this anymore. Your three addictions and your health problems and your terrible way of dealing with it is killing me. And the kids that we have, they don't even want to be around you anymore. And so this man, having realized that he has failed at everything that mattered most to him, is ready to take his life until 
He walks into an air-conditioned room on the campus of Canyon Ridge. And at the risk of finding people who would condemn him and judge him and just try to impress him with lights, instead what he finds is Celebrate Recovery, where a bunch of people with all kinds of their own hurts, habits, and hangups don't judge him, don't condemn him, but come around him and invite him in and start to point him toward his identity and his worth in Christ and realizing that no matter what he's failed at, he has worth because Jesus says he has worth. And as they come around him and invite him into that community, he realizes, look, I don't know what's gonna happen with my marriage or my family, but my life is worth it. And so he starts to step into that. They help him figure out how to step back in to his marriage, which, you know, I, I guess maybe it's not worth investing in the chairs for them to sit on so they can hear that message or the, or the screens or the microphones where they can actually hear those things or the people who clean the room so it wasn't dirty, or the pastor who was there who put the program together who could actually help those people hear that message and collide with other people. Maybe it's not worth investing in the local church like Saddleback who wrote the program years ago and has helped thousands upon thousands of people out of hurts, habits, and hangups, including addictions. Maybe it's not worth it, but in my mind, it might be a little bit worth it for this guy because this guy went back to his wife and said, I'm different, I'm in. I'm not obedient to these addictions anymore. God's helping me out and I have a phenomenal community. I'm gonna show you what life is worth and what it's like. And so this marriage starts to get back together. Flash forward six months, and what you see is a dad living as well as possible in a marriage that is recovering, and kids who, instead of running from their father, are asking their father what it looks like to follow Jesus, which, by the way, it's interesting that as you walk, watch them walk across the campus, that these kids get dropped off at this facility where an army of volunteers offering their hearts to these kids to invite them in to know Jesus so that they would never end up in the place that their dad ended up six months before. For. And they do that in such a way that is safe and controlled and all these different things so that parents could walk peacefully across campus and grab the same free coffee that you grab and the same seat that you sit in so that they could hear a message and realize that there's a way forward, that God's crazy about them, that their past doesn't define them, that Jesus has rescued them, and their kids are hearing the same message so that just like you'll walk out of here in a little bit, they walk out, pick those kids up, and step forward in life knowing they never, ever have to go back to where they were six months before. Does the church matter? I will unapologetically say that you should give in a place that captures your heart. And you should give in a place that frees you from the obligation of the stress of thinking it all depends on you. And you should give in a place that makes a difference. And I don't know a better place for that than the local church. Are there great organizations doing awesome things in the name of Jesus? Yes, and we give to those on top of the local church, but I want my heart here, and I want the difference made in the local church, and I think you should too. I think God's called us to it, and if this isn't a church that you can trust to do that, then I suggest you find a local church in the name of Jesus somewhere and give financially to that church. Give your heart, give your time, give your energy, give your effort, because there are people desperate for the life that you are finding. And us giving to that, is worth it. To say the local church doesn't make any difference, it just doesn't even make sense to me. It doesn't make the most important difference. You'd have to tell 900 kids around the world that this church, outside of our normal giving as a church, the 900 kids through compassion that are gonna find a totally different future because we sponsor them to the tune of about half a million dollars a year, outside of what we give here. We should give to make a difference. And God makes a difference in us here. And I think we should give here to come together because I think the church should be the place that our country finds our way back together. And I think God deserves the credit. In fact, when Jesus decided where to place his heart, where did he place his treasure? What captured Jesus' heart? Feel free to look at the person next to you or in a mirror because that's where his heart was. And so where did he place his treasure? He gave his life for us. In fact, uh, if you join us Thursday night, and I, I hope that you do, we'll paint a picture, and I'll shoot you straight. At the end, I'm gonna ask you to give. You know why? Because God makes a difference in the local church, and he'll make a difference in your heart if you give. And so I get that that bugs people. But I can't look at this and draw many other conclusions. I just can't. It's worth it. And so let me show you real quickly as we wrap up one thing. When Paul was telling these people, hey, here's the best way to go about giving, let me just give you some practical, biblical advice about giving. Rapid fire, three minutes. You ready? 1 Corinthians 16. 
Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. So he writes this letter to a church in Corinth, and he says, each of you, on the first day of each week, set aside a portion. Then we'll put it together as the people of God and safely transport it from where it was given to where it was intended to be spent in the church in Jerusalem. So let me just draw a few quick conclusions about how we should give, how we should all give. Notice he says, each of you. Did he say, hey, rich people? Did he say, hey, people who don't have a mortgage? Hey, people who are, um, have the job of their lives? He didn't give any qualifications. He said, each of you, each of you, every single one of you should give. If you follow Jesus, you should give, Period. In Jesus' name, you should give, each of you, he says. So we all give, and we all give consistently, because he didn't say on some weekends, he says what? On the first day of each week. You know why? Because you don't shape your heart inconsistently. You just don't. It'd be like trying to get in shape by going to the gym like once every other month and doing a push-up and then leaving. <laughs> Tell the lady at the front desk, say, hey, Ann, I'll be back in a couple months. <laughs> Looking good, just kidding. Right? It's not how it happens. We give consistently. And here's the thing. Our life goes like this and our finances go like this. You know what doesn't go like this? God. And so when we give consistently, he consistently shows up. And we find out over time that there's never a time he goes like this. And we can trust him. So we give consistently each week. We also give proportionately. We are not all going to give the same amount. God has not provided us all the same amount. That would be crazy. Some of you would struggle to give $10 right now to anything in Jesus' name. Some of you could write a check for a million and not blink. But what should we do? God's interested in our heart, not the amount. He's interested in more and more and more of our heart. But here's what happens. When we decide ahead of time, when we give in proportion to what we make, it says in, first, or in 2 Corinthians 8 and here in 16, it says when we give a portion of what we have made, especially when we decide ahead of time, we put God first that he is the most important thing before we buy a Yeti or anything else, he is first. And so we give proportionately. And again, because he doesn't go like this, we can give proportionately. And then we increase that over time. And we make a habit of it. It helps us be consistent. And so if you're bold, ask God, what proportion do you want me to give? What percentage do you want me to give? In the Old Testament, God asked people to give 10%. I don't see that amplified in the New Testament. I always see Jesus ask us to go beyond that and, and shape our hearts, but start somewhere. Proportionately, percentage-wise, there is life in what God called us to, and there's freedom in what he called us to. And so we give a percent, and we give together. You know why we give together? Because it's not about credit for me or credit for you. It's about credit for God. And so no person in Corinth got a personal thank you letter and there was no engraving of their names on things. It was the church, God's church in Corinth that sent a gift to God's church in Jerusalem and God got the credit. And so we give together because we need to come together. And when you walk across campus and look, or you jump online with a whole bunch of other people and you look other people in the eye or interact with them, you realize that when I give, you're giving to that person. You're not giving to some nebulous bucket somewhere. You're saying that person matters. I give this person and these people my heart for this season. So we give together. And we give wisely. Did you notice he said that he's going to put together a group of people to carry the money? That's because they didn't have PayPal. They didn't have text to give. They had gold in a bag. That's what they had. Or silver in a bag. And so they put together a group of trusted people that would ensure it gets from here to there. And you should always, always, always give the money that God has given you to places that handle it with great diligence, respect, and accountability. I believe that we're true of that place. I don't think we're the only place. But it should have the proper mission and accountability. We should give wisely because God's given it to us. We should steward it well. And finally, we should all give freely. Sometimes when we give the cause, we're buying a particular thing. Instead, the more freely we can give to God's people and God's church, wherever that is, and give it to a trusted plurality of leadership to determine with God where that should go, and then we jump in and participate, the more we can have confidence that we're just offering God what he gave us. We're not directing it. We're not controlling it. We're just saying, God, I give you control. Here it is. 
And I believe the local church is the best place to do that. So we give consistently, proportionally, together, and freely. And finally, can I just say this? Give with a vision. Give with a vision. Like a preferred future, how you dream things could be. Ask God to give you a vision for giving. Years ago, this guy said, I want the biggest check I write every single week to be to God's church. And I was like, that's crazy. I don't know how to do that, man. I got a mortgage. Passed it years ago. Worth it. There's this other guy who who said he wanted to get to 50% of his income. That's so far in the future for me. What about a lifetime giving goal? I was, I mean, over the course of my life, I would love to give God's church over a million dollars. For some of you, that you could do it today. For some of you, like, I can't even imagine that. But have a vision. Maybe your vision is this. I just want to give consistently. I want to start training my heart with even a small amount of money to somewhere in God's name. Maybe that percentage needs to increase because you haven't been uncomfortable and you're giving for a while and you need to do that. We don't grow in comfort, everybody, just so you know. We don't grow in comfort. So find a way to get uncomfortable in the way you give to God and the things that he's doing in the world. And then here's the thing. Once God's given you a vision, you've decided on a vision. Number two, make a plan. Make a plan. Notice I didn't say make an excuse. We all do that really well. We've been doing it for the last 35 minutes. But instead, make a plan. And then start now. Start now. Not later. Start now. Find a way to start giving God your heart, to return to reality, to make a difference, to come together, and to give credit where credit is due. I'm praying that every single one of us finds more life than before by giving more than ever before. God wants your heart. And one of the best ways to get there is your money. And so let's make a difference. Let's give generously. Let's give God our heart and let's make a difference in our city. I think it's what God's called us to. Every single person, in every single way, coming alive in Christ. It's worth giving our heart to. Our energy, our time, our emotion, our voice, and our money. Would you stand and pray with me? And so, God, uh, <laughs> some of the things you say are hard to hear, uh, and yet that doesn't make them less true. And so, God, I pray we'd trust you. Like we always pray, I pray that we would trust you, and I pray that we would take action in trust of you, that we would find a way, that we would make it happen. We would give you more than ever before. And, God, I pray not only for this local church, but for your local church all around our city, all around our country, and all around our world that you would fuel the people of God, not organizations, not buildings, but the people of God to come more and more alive in you and invite more and more people to life to you, in you, so that you get the glory and so that you get the credit and so the world looks like you always dreamed it would. God, help us be great participants in that. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Man, it's fun to preach when you're not gonna be here for three months. (laughs) You can send all emails to mharrison at canyonridge.org. We hope you have an awesome week. Go check out all the kids from Bolivia. They need your help. We'll see you next week.